example and dissolving it into tetrahydrofuran. Uh, so this is a complete dissolution. Uh, the plastic will dissolve and uh, we now have a solution. Um, if you sonicate this sample while the, the when you first put the PVC uh, toy in, uh, typically with a 15, 30 minute sonication, uh, you'll have a completely dissolved solution. So it makes things a little bit quicker. Uh, after we have a dissolved solution, we'll precipitate in hexanes. Uh, this removes the PVC from the solution. So we'll get a, a solid precipitate that leaves the phthalates in solution, makes it a little bit easier to analyze. Uh, so we'll move into the analysis step with GCMS. Um, and I'll mention here that uh, the CPSC method allows for several alternative methods within it. Uh, this is to impart flexibility for testing labs. Uh, if a lab is already familiar or likes to use a certain test method, uh, that method, uh, those that are listed are available to use instead. Uh, so generally, the alternative methods, uh, usually what differs is the extraction technique. Um, and most of them fall into one of the categories I have listed here. Uh, a couple of them fall into just a typical fluid extraction where you're uh, cutting up the sample um, and you're putting it into a, a solvent, uh, usually dichloromethane, um, and letting it sit. Uh, the California Department of Toxic Substances uh, uh, method asks just for a 15-minute uh, uh, time, um, and the Health Canada method is a much longer rate, 12-hour uh, time. So even with this, with this step, you have a, a long range of uh, sample times. Uh, Soxlet extraction is more of an aggressive fluid extraction. Uh, here you have an apparatus that I have shown on the right uh, where you're, you have a, a ground up sample um, and the solvent is, is heated and then cooled. The solvent will come down through the sample. Uh, so you're having a continuous extraction with uh, fresh solvent. Uh, usually the, the methods call for about six hours. Uh, methods under this category are the, uh, the Chinese method and European methods, which I have listed, um, and also EPA methods. Uh, there's some other older methods that we, we see using this as well. Uh, there are a couple other techniques uh, typically found with, uh, within the EPA methodologies. Uh, there we're looking at uh, using different tools for your extraction, uh, such as using a microwave uh, pressurized fluid extraction uh, or a, uh, ultrasonic extraction. Uh, and the common bond here we're looking for is an analysis by GCMS. Uh, we think this is important. GCMS is our, our preferred analysis technique uh, because it's qualitative and quantitative. Uh, here I have a, a chromatogram shown of an analysis with a, a standard of all six uh, of the uh, specifically regulated phthalates. And uh, generally we're getting a, a, a pretty good uh, separation, uh, especially for the lower molecular weight ones. Um, and obviously the uh, DNOP, DINP, and DIDP, which you see in the, the later half of the chromatogram, around, around 11, 12 minutes, uh, that's where things get a little bit trickier, and we'll be talking a little bit more about that today. Um, we specify GCMS because some older methods call for GCFID, um, and simply put, if you're having any overlap in your chromatogram with different, with different phthalates, uh, FID is just not strong enough to, to get a full uh, qualitative and quantitative <coughs> assessment. Uh, so I'm going to briefly go over some common problems. Uh, I'm going to give you very, very simple problems and very simple solutions that probably don't do these uh, justice, but just to get uh, the, the ideas flowing for, for discussion later. Um, some common questions we get, uh, often people are asked, uh, is there a standard reference material for uh, phthalates and PVC? Um, another common uh, problem is uh, false positive results. Uh, man, a manufacturer or someone else might say, I did not put uh, phthalates in this item. I'm sure there's no phthalates in this item, but the test lab still said uh, that, um, that there were phthalates in this. So that could either come under a false positive result or a result of contamination uh, somewhere along the lines. Um, another issue is the identity of diacinonal and diacidecal phthalate. Both of these phthalates actually have uh, multiple uh, cast numbers. So there's uh, different ways of making these compounds, um, and there's a different chemical formula of these compounds. Uh, so try to trying to uh, summarize uh, some of these issues and solutions as best we can. Um, there are multiple uh, issues of the CPSC method. It's been updated a few times. Uh, we're now on the third version. Uh, sometimes people with problems uh, 
they'll contact us and say, well, I was following the first version of this, and this is the problem I've had. There are, uh, there are significant advancements between the versions, uh, so make sure you're definitely using the most current one. Uh, we have an interagency agreement with uh, NIST to develop standard reference materials. Um, this has been an ongoing project. Uh, the last update uh, has been that they're hoping to have something within the next calendar year. Uh, we'll, we'll see how that develops. Uh, but this is uh, a promising uh, idea. Uh, there's also some companies that we've seen, I believe Spec Certiprep has started issuing a, a certified reference material. Uh, they have a, a specific level of phthalates in uh, polyethylene. Um, so that's another frontier. You can look with uh, standards companies. They may also be developing their own uh, or looking for something along those lines. Uh, I mentioned contamination before. Uh, this is possible, and this is a, a good question to ask if you're a manufacturer or a seller. Uh, essentially, from the starting point to the end point, have I looked at every possible area where phthalates can come into my line? Um, We've heard of uh, recycling plastics. Sometimes people use recycled plastics that had phthalates in before, um, and that, could, that level of phthalates in the new uh, material could be enough to, to lead to a failure. Uh, also is the equipment that's being used. Have they run phthalates? Have they been properly cleaned? Uh, essentially, you need to break down and look at every step. Are you sure that uh, every step of the way is, uh, there's no way that contamination can come into this issue? Uh, and finally, a lot of our uh, suggestions and uh, emphasis is on qualitative analysis uh, by technical staff, and I'll be going into this more. Uh, but we have uh, a few key points here. Uh, we, the, our CPSC method calls for a retention time match uh, with a standard phthalate. So make sure when you're looking at the chromatogram and the chromatogram of a sample, the retention time must match or else that should be a red flag. Uh, also, a mass spectrum match. This in, uh, not just the general mass spectrum, but the ion ratio is very important and can help in identifying. Uh, blank analysis is crucial for looking for contamination within the lab result itself. Uh, if you run a blank and you're seeing phthalates in there, that means you have contamination along, somewhere along the line. Uh, if people are reusing glassware, uh, we found in our lab that our uh, GCMS inlet liner sometimes can carry these phthalates over. Uh, so it's they're persistent enough that they can come along the line even within the lab. Um, and I mentioned before, the DINP and DIDP have multiple cast numbers. Uh, if you look closely and you, and you get standards of both, you'll see their chromatogram peak shape is, is a little different. Uh, so this is a great way to identify which uh, material you're working for. And you should be, if you're uh, quantifying one specific cast number of DINP or DIDP, uh, your standard should be that same cast number so you get a, a, a fully uh, well-developed match. So I'll just give you a few examples of, of why a, a strong qualitative assessment will help. Uh, here I have two chromatograms. One is of uh, DINP and the other is of uh, a common phthalate alternative, DINCH. Uh, if you're looking at the peak shape, uh, they mostly look the same. If you're looking specifically at peaks and valleys, you can kind of tell they're a little different. Uh, but uh, our experience, and I can see this translating to other labs, is if you have a sort of an automated quantification procedure where the computer will sort of do the work for you, if it's looking for a broad peak in this time range, it may not know the difference between DINP and DI, uh, DINCH. So here, this is where a simple uh, mass spectrum look uh, can really elucidate the differences. Uh, the DINCH base uh, ion is 155. Uh, versus DINP, which is 149. So all it really takes is a quick uh, a look at the mass spectrum, and you'll be able to tell the difference. Uh, another issue we've run into is uh, DNOP versus dioctyl terephthalate, another common alternative. Uh, here I have chromatograms of uh, the two of those. Uh, you can see the retention time is awfully close, 11.15 minutes versus 11.10 minutes. Um, and here uh, I've noticed that our... Uh, our previous settings for our uh, computer quantification program, uh, if the tolerances are empty enough, or, or wide enough, sorry, uh, it may not be able to tell the difference, especially since their mass spectrum is pretty similar. If you're, looking, if you're running a SIM scan and looking at uh, the typical DNOP uh, uh, mass ions, uh, DOTP covers those as well. But uh, if, you do, if you're 
uh, thorough and follow through with your qualitative assessment, uh, you'll see here's our, our DNOP, uh, typical mass spectrum. Uh, base peak, again, is 149. Uh, there's a little bit of uh, 167 and 279 uh, mass ions. Uh, we'll compare that directly with DOTP, and here you can see the, the jump in the 261 ion. Uh, it's almost 50% uh, uh, relative to 149. Uh, so if you're looking, if you're, again, if you're doing an automated program, uh, you might get a false positive here if you had DOTP. So, okay, so we'll uh, start to shift into the, the rest of the talk here, or the rest of the, the symposium. Um, with a discussion about emerging technologies. Uh, we'll have a block of, of speakers today discussing portable spectroscopy. Uh, we've started using this as a phthalate screening tool, uh, a general kind of yes or no, might this item have phthalates? Uh, it's, when, when this law was passed, people commonly asked, well, what's the XRF, um, so if we're looking for an XRF for lead, what's the phthalate? Um, comparable option we have. Uh, and this is, uh, so far, the most promising uh, technology. Um, also, I'll refer you to this uh, a paper by uh, Zhang et al. Uh, last year from Chemical Communications. Uh, they developed a colorimetric test. Uh, it's a different application. They're looking for phthalates in water. Um, but I imagine with the right ingenuity and the right research, uh, this might be adapted for uh, toys or childcare articles. Uh, they use modified gold nanoparticles um, that actually changed uh, color in water when phthalates were present. Uh, and also, uh, we're big fans of direct analysis and real-time mass spectrometry. Um, I won't, we'll have a talk on that later, so I won't uh, steal too much of that thunder, but um, it's promising for a screening tool, and uh, we think with the right research, uh, possibly also a quantification method. Uh, so just a couple more sources for information. Uh, we have CPSC has its own phthalates website uh, where you can get uh, information, uh, common questions. Um, also, we have a, a lab frequently asked questions page there. Uh, if you're interested more in the chronic hazard advisory panel, there's also a website for that. Uh, they should be issuing a, a ruling, uh, I believe, in the, within the calendar year. Uh, there's currently an ASTM uh, work group uh, focused specifically on phthalate analysis for low-level percentages. Um, so I have this information here. And finally, EPA has a Design for an Environment um, program, and they're looking at alternatives to phthalates. Uh, generally, the idea is uh, anyone that's interested in the phthalate realm and they're interested in alternatives, uh, they can uh, propose alternatives. I think they'll be looking at some toxicology issues. Uh, so any company that's looking to move, uh, this might be a, a good website to follow. Uh, and with that, I'll uh, take any questions. Yeah, Alan. Just one quick question. What, was, what is NIST? Oh, uh, sorry, he asked what NIST is. NIST is the National Institute for Standards and Technology. Yes? Do you have a definition for uh, we consider uh, screening just essentially a, a tool or a method to kind of give you a generic yes or no answer if, if phthalates are present. Um, when we look as a screening tool for, if we're looking for lead, we use x-ray fluorescence as a screening tool. Uh, this will give us a, essentially 30 seconds to a minute. Uh, we have a general idea of, of if lead is present or there. So that's sort of the uh, itinerary we're looking for with phthalates. With the screening, is, is there any percent level of false uh, he asks if there's a, a acceptable level for screening as far as false positives or not. Um, I think that's to be determined. You know, we're trying to work with the H technology will have its own limitations, and uh, you know, I think the best we can get on any regards will will work with for now. Um, I mean, for a generic tool, if you know our, the limit's 0.1 percent, and I think for a, a final screening tool, it will be able it will need to be able to reach that. Um, but uh, there might be different ways to adapt that technology or different applications to try and use that to your best advantage. Uh, hi, I'm Joel Recht. I'm the chemistry division director here. I just wanted to add to that the, the what's needed from a screening tool depends somewhat on what it's being used for as well. So uh, a firm, uh, we have a, a speaker here from uh, BASF today. BASF produces uh, phthalates. Their need to screen 
uh, for for products, you know, for for perhaps uh, impurities in their line are different than the needs that we have as a regulatory agency or a, a manufacturer who might look to do screening in between their full tests. So, you know, there there can still be room for for these screening methods where it makes sense in a particular uh, uh, end use. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Oh, uh... Yeah, we, we consider screen printing applicable to the regulation. Yes? Going back to your definition of the screening, uh, do you consider screening to be quantitative, not just qualitative? Well, I think we're, we'd like to work towards that point. Right. Um, it would be ideal, but uh, we don't think it's at that point yet. So the diactyl terephthalates? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we think they've been in use for. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, has uh, DOTP dioxyl terephthalate uh, been in use often? Uh, yes, we 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 have we've we're familiar with it. We think it's been use in use for a while. Uh, that's not my. I'm not. I can't <laughs> answer that. That that would be a good question for the EPA design for uh, alternatives and the and the chronic hazard advisory panel. All right, great. Uh, why don't we uh, move along? Uh, our next speaker is uh, Rafael Acosta from Agilent. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Matt, for uh, inviting me here to this symposium. It's very exciting for us to be here. And what I'm going to do today is share with you some of the different mass spectrometry techniques that may aid you in solving that problem of contamination or library matching or retention times matching up. Uh, what are some of the tools that we could use and what are some of the applications that Agilent or our scientists in the field have developed to meet this growing need uh, of phthalates in, in consumer products and specific in toys in, in particular. So I'll go through some of the uh, GCMS portfolio, the different technologies of diff different flavors of mass spectrometry that could aid you in identifying phthalates in a way that gives you that much more confidence in your lab. I'll go through uh, the application notes developed by our scientists in the field, and then we'll go through some of the ongoing work that we internally at Agilent are working with to solve this problem of uh, trying to reach uh, the levels required and the different technologies and level of confidence in your results. So for example, the Agilent GCMS uh, portfolio includes not only single quads, iron traps, mobile uh, mass spectrometers, as well as high-end triple quads, and now QTOF technology for mass spectrometry. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll say how each of these different techniques apply to your particular analysis. What are some of the extra information that you get from each individual technique? So for example, we, know, we have here the usual suspects of uh, the phthalates of interest, uh, their cast number, their molecular weights, and their corresponding ions uh, for SIM analysis. Uh, the typical GC conditions that was used in this particular application was a 30 meter column, uh, 0 0.25, 0 0.25 micron, uh, DB5 ultra inert column that this will allow, allow you to uh, have more, the ultra inertness allows you to have more runs per sample, less bleed in your chromatograms. Uh, since our mass specs are very sensitive, uh, the, there is a split ratio of 20 to 1 to avoid contamination and column overload. Uh, carrier gas is helium. However, we're noticing that customers are asking us, hey, can we use hydrogen for analysis? And that's something that uh, you definitely can do with your single quads uh, GCMS. However, we're trying to see how that could aid you more. Uh, the cost of helium, as you may or may not know, is going up drastically recently, and we're trying to address that in terms of uh, how can we take advantage of the properties of, he of hydrogen as a carrier gas, which is not a new thing. In Europe, they currently use that's the, the carrier gas of choice, and we're trying to uh, 
make our U.S. Uh, customers aware of this as well. Not only do you get the benefits of maybe having a uh, reducing your cost of analysis by having hydrogen through a, a hydrogen generator in your lab, but also have faster chromatography. So we definitely want to ensure that you're aware of, the, of that, the possibility that th that, that could bring to your labs. Uh, for example, here we have a, uh, a total ion chromatogram of uh, a pacifier extract, unspiked and spiked, with two parts per million phthalate mixture. On top, you'll see uh, the butylated hydroxytoluene as the main uh, peak in the pacifier. However, when we spike it at 2 ppm, we we're still able to see this matrix uh, uh, very nicely. So uh, we, again, uh, the DIMP and the DIP, DI, DP are very uh, a little bit less sensitive uh, to uh, particular analysis of EI. However, there are things that uh, that I'll mention throughout my presentation that may allow you to see higher levels of these particular compounds, and we'll, we'll go through that as well. Okay, so for example, you're talking about sample cleanup and contamination. One possible way to avoid contamination may be to use uh, SPME, or solid phase microextraction, in your analysis, which reduces some of the, the non-analytes of interest or the, or the matrix of your of particular toys or analysis that would allow you to have cleaner chromatograms uh, and less contamination and more throughput per samples uh, running through your GCMS. Okay, so for example, so these for these particular compounds of interest, these phthalates of interest, we are able to reach in the in the levels of uh, from 0.25 milligrams per liter to 10 uh, with, with a good linear dynamic range, and we have individual retention times for these, so we could definitely identify them not only based on retention time but also on uh, the spectrum as well with the, with the GCMS. One of the things that you may that you may have is if you're doing high throughput analysis in your lab and you want to ensure, have one method throughout your lab, you want to ensure that you employ something that we call retention time locking. Uh, how, how many of you uh, use GCMS for analysis of phthalates today in your labs? How many of you have an Agilent system in your lab? And how many of you are using retention time locking in your instruments so that each retention time in each instrument that you have with the same method is exactly the same? Okay, I'll, I'll talk through that. I'll, I'll go through that in my presentation and how that could aid you in having that much more confidence. It's one of the hidden secrets that we have, and we, uh, my job here today is to make you aware of these features that may make your life a little easier in the lab when you're analyzing phthalates uh, or other compounds of interest as well. Uh, okay, so I'll go here. Uh, so, for example, let's say you want to take your, your lab method and you want to take it in the field. Uh, in the back of a mobile lab and you want to test at the point of sale of a particular product, you could do that with our Agilent uh, 5975T for transportable, which employs LTM technology. Essentially what you have now here is you have the same mass spectrometer that you're used to in your lab and you're able to take it in the field at a third of the footprint and half the power consumption. Uh, you could run it, 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 it as part of a mobile lab if you're looking for phthalates in the field, for example. Uh, and essentially, as I mentioned before, the LTM technology, what it does is it's essentially a heated oven. So essentially, your capillary column is inductively coupled with a heater that allows the maximum amount of, of heat transfer very efficient, efficiently. So now you have faster heating and cooling times, so your chromatography may also, it will also improve. So you have more sample through, but now chromatograms that will take you 20 to 25 minutes for analysis may take you five or less minutes for the same analysis and still having the same resolution and sensitivity. So again, that's, that's something for you if you're not aware of, for you to think about if you're thinking about doing mobile lab applications of phthalates in the field. Okay. So, so one of the things that, that at Agile that we, that we recently were excited about is the introduction of ion trap technology for uh, GCMS. Uh, and one of the benefits that you receive with ion trap technology is the ability to do multiple ionization techniques within the same chromatogram. So for example, for an ion, for a particular phthalate that may not be as responsive to EI analysis, you could do uh, CI analysis, chemical ionization on the same compound in the same run in the same chromatogram. So you could switch from EI to CI without changing the source in the same run, which will allow you greater sensitivity uh, and, and specificity for analytes of interest. And I'll, sh I'll show a particular example of that. In this case, we have uh, DINP and DIPP, DIDP, 
and we have them in EI and CI. If you notice, the EI spectrum shows the classical mass 149 as, as, the, as the parent peak. However, if we use CI with MTBE, liquid MTBE, we're able to uh, differentiate the two now based, you see, uh, have the molecular iron be the parent peak, and now we have 419 and 447. Okay, the molecular iron is in a higher intensity. So if, you, if this is something that, that may be interest of you for, for you to identify the two, uh, you have the flexibility of doing CI, uh, liquid CI with MTBE to allow you to differentiate those two and give you that much more degrees of confidence. Okay? And again, this is coupled to the same 7890 GC seam pneumatics that you're used to on the front end, uh, just a different ionization technique, ion trap technology on the back end. Okay? So here, for example, in, in terms of calibration curve uh, for BBP and DBP, uh, we're, we're able to go down to levels of uh, one parts per billion or less. Okay. So now we mentioned uh, the, the other flavor of mass spectrometry that could be applied to the Thales analysis involves the use of a triple quadrupole GCMS. And I'll go briefly into how that operates. Currently in, in our lab in, in Santa Clara, uh, one of our applications are uh, chemists in, in conjunction with, uh, with Frontier, uh, we have a pyrolyzer system, and it, you might hear some of that uh, today, but essentially uh, we're, we're analyzing uh, phthalates using triple quadruple uh, GCMS, and that gives us a different degrees of confidence and also lower sensitivity, and that there's an application note coming soon with that information, but I'll talk briefly of some of the preliminary results that we, that we have obtained. So let me give you a little brief overview of how triple quadrupole GCMS operates. For, for example, you have your typical spectrum. So you ionize your samples. They give you an EI mode in this particular example. You get a classical spectrum. Okay, everything is ionized, broken down into individual components. However, through the first quadrupole, we isolate one ion. In this case, we select the most intense ion, which is 210. We'll select that ion in this particular case. And you're simming on that ion. You pass it, that ion through a collision cell, hit it with some energy and some collision gases. You're able to break down that ion even further into two individual components. And then you can monitor multiple ions from that secondary fragmentation. In this case, it will be a transition of, for example, 210 going to 158 and 191, which may give you that much more uh, fragmentation and identification for some of the uh, trouble analytes of interest. Okay, so in this case, we have an MRM tink, uh, thick uh, total ion chromatogram in, of phthalates and lemon oil. Okay, this is this is the MRM tink, the EI spectra of DNOB in the triple quad. And you can see that the ion ratios are, are very similar uh, to your uh, NIST libraries that you're used to. And we have developed transition. We have developed MRM transition, multiple reaction monitoring transition, for our different uh, phthalates of interest. Where now, if you're interested in having more information of your th uh, on your phthalates and hitting that one particular ion with some energy and a collision flow, you're able to get uh, two individual transitions: one for quantitation, one for qualitation, and you're able to develop uh, set up iron ratios for each particular transition, therefore they'll meet a particular requirement for your quantitation. This decreases your, fall, your false positives. What Matt was talking about, about false positives being a big problem, MSMS could potentially solve that for you, reduces the amount of false positives uh, in, in your thalates analysis. Okay, now for, for higher quality data and for more interesting results, for example, you could take the power of QTOF uh, mass accuracy and high resolution for the analysis of phthalates in high matrix, you have the ability to do MSMS and EI as well. And in this case, what we have is our traditional tr triple quad, which is based on your single quad mass spectrometer that you're used to currently using in your lab. We took that technology a step further and incorporated our triple quad mass spectrometer to our TOF mass spectrometer that we have in our we had in our LC world and we made this marriage of uh, QTOF. So now you have the ability of doing full scan, high resolution, high mass accuracy, uh, less than 5 ppm mass accuracy. And, you're, and I'll, I'll show you what that gives you, what level of information that provides you in a second. So for example, if you're used to looking at your typical uh, single quad mass spectrometer 
and we look at MAT, MAT 604, what you see in the red is your typical uh, spectrum. However, it, with the TOF technology, you're able to really resolve the 613 and the 614, the 614, and, and, and you get accurate masses to the point that you have more resolution. And when we talk about resolution, we're talking about the, the space between the two, the two different uh, isotopes there that you see. Okay, so that, that's one level of uh, uh, confidence that will also decrease your false positive and negative. So if you have a high matrix and things that may be interfering, uh, QTOP technology with the high mass accuracy and resolution may give you that extra uh, level of confidence of being able to see the, the needle in the haystack a little bit better. Okay? So for example, your typical mass spectrometer has an has a uncertainty of, let's say, 0.3 AMUs, and for mass 271, 0.98 AMU, there are 7,600 compounds that are possible based on that mass uncertainty of 1,000 ppm. As the, as the uncertainty decreases, let's say to a level of 1 ppm, or parts per million, now you have 11 possible compounds that, you, that are possible with that particular uh, ion of interest. So, so that's, that's one of the, again, reduces your false positives a high level of degree of confidence in, in your analysis. Uh, so to, to those of you that are using uh, our, our mass spectrometers for the analysis of phthalates, retention time locking is very important. And, and as Matt discussed earlier, uh, retention time is one of the requirements for, for the methods of analysis. Having retention time locking allows you to have one method on one mass spectrometer, transfer that method to a second mass spectrometer, and they'll have the exact retention time, okay? And whether you perform column maintenance or not, you're able to just relock the method. It's very simple to do. It just takes five injections. You can do it overnight or uh, over a lunch break or right, you can do it actually while you are uh, commissioning your instruments for analysis, doing your performance check. You take one analyte of interest, you look for that ion. What it does is retention time locking. What it does, it incorporates all the possible variations in column length, pressure, or whether uh, you have a difference of a few millimeters going into the inlet or not. It, it takes all the possible errors, incorporates them into a pressure error, and allows you to match your retention times with, to, for method transfer. Okay, So in any system across the, so if you have a lab in the East Coast, the West Coast, the, the retention times will be the same if you're trying to match uh, your phthalates and analytes of interest. So this, yes, you have a question. Yes, yes, you could do that. Well, you change column. That retention time, if you want the IP to be at 11 minutes, 11.001 minutes, it will be at 11.01 minutes in this instrument and that instrument, whether you change your column every day, all day, year after year, and it's free. It's included in your, in your ChemStation software. It's a button. If you go in your method, uh, there will be a, a, an option instrument, retention time lock, and it will ask you to put a, a vial in, in a particular position, position one. It will do five runs at five different pressures and then it'll make a calibration of pressure versus retention time, and then it'll retain that calibration file, and then you're able to, your method will be locked to a particular compound, so if you want to lock whether on your internal standard or whatever it is, you can lock in your internal standard, and the, those retention times will match. That way, uh, you won't have to question, is it this phthalate or is it that phthalate? No, because the retention times will match all day, every day, okay? Again, and retention time locking is available. Everything from the, from our 70, 5975E single quad to our QTOF, okay, even our, to your mobile lab. If you want to retention time in your mobile lab, you have that flexibility. So again, it, it, one of the things I want to emphasize is, and what the other speakers will go into different other front ends that 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 may aid you in analysis. But I wanted to focus on the different capabilities. Is the take home message here is that. If you're looking for routine analysis and you want to do NIST MDC convolution, our single quad will be do a great job. If you're having problems with high matrix interference, then there's, uh, that's when a triple quad may be uh, more suitable for the analysis because it will give you that MRM transition of one ion going to two different transitions with two different ion ratios, so you get more degrees of confidence. And if going from EI to CI is something that you really want to do for your analysis to give you that peace of mind and give you that much more confidence in your results, 
that's when uh, an iron trap with li liquid CI with MTBE may, may aid you even more. Uh, I just want to, the references, uh, you can look these up in our application notes and there's more to come, spe specifically on the QTOF and the triple quad analysis. And uh, I want to give a special thanks to uh, the scientists that have worked on this, uh, Stephen Bowman, Fred Fireherm, Robert Kubis, and, and Matt, thank you for inviting us to be here today. Uh, any questions? Yes. One quick, uh, several years ago, I guess there was an application note uh, published by using of uh, ammonia, I think is a CI source. They gave very good resolution for in the, you know, the parent ions and so forth. And is that possible to use these methods to differentiate uh, the IN, the ID, the IDP? As, as Matt pointed out, they tend to overlap and are hard to... Uh, yes. You, Oh yes, the, the question was uh, whether we could use a uh, ammonia CI reagent uh, for the analysis of phthalates, and the answer is yes, you, you can. In this particular case, it, it was uh, MTBE was used for for the analysis, but you could definitely use ammonia or even methane if that wish. But ammonia tends tends to be more sensitive in terms of CI from what we've seen in, in particular for phthalates. Yes, good question. Any any other questions? Yes. Does retention time locking work for multiple analytes? The answer is yes. What retention time locking does is it takes one particular analyte, and typically in the middle of your chromatogram, so you pick whatever analytes and you lock on that, and everything else is going to be relative to that. So if, if, you, if this analyte match, everything else should match, uh, depending on you have a good column, and your column is not bad. So yes, so it, all, all the components will be retention time locked, but you only lock a one compound, everything else is relative. Thank you. How does the retention time uh, locking work for some of the uglier chromatograms like the IMP and DIDP where it's a broader peak? Um, is, there, is that an issue or is that handled pretty well? Uh, with broader peaks, retention time locking, what it's going to do is you're still going to have that broad peak. However, that broad peak will be at the same time. So that, that's essentially what's going to happen. It's not going to aid your, your, your chromatography in terms of resolution, but it will give you that same time for that blob of gram that you, that you have for the IMP. Yes. Good question. Yes, another question. Your triple, is that trapping? And if so, how is the uh, trapping function affected the quantitative ability in the presence of various amounts of ions either with matrix or without? Okay. The question is, is our uh, triple quad uh, trapping our ions? And the answer is, it's not really trapping. It's scanning. Scanning very fast, and it's taking a selectively passing ions that we select that we want. So for example, in this particular example that I showed, let's say you want to uh, isolate 149. I'm one, ion 149 will go through the, the quad, it'll reach a collision cell. Once it reaches the collision cell, it'll be hit with a particular energy, typically between 10 and 15 volts, electron volts, and, and a collision gas. And from there, we'll have two different transitions that we can monitor, typically the, most, the two strongest transitions, to give you that much more degrees of confidence. The question was, is there any gain uh, function, automatic gain function? The answer is, there is no automatic gain. However, for compounds of interest, you could adjust the gains in the different uh, time segments. So, for example, for analytes that are maybe less sensitive, you may adjust the gain uh, at that particular moment in time. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh, thank you so much. Thanks, Robert. You're welcome. Uh, up next, we have Bob Freeman from uh, Frontier Labs. Okay. All right, good morning. Uh, I'd like to thank Matt for the opportunity to talk about the method uh, that's been in development now for about two or three years. Uh, about, about three years ago, we started at the ASTM D20, formed a committee to uh, look at low-level phthalates in polyvinyl chloride. And for the past two or three years, this is what we focused on. We've done two sets of round-robin samples, and we've done an independent validation study with uh, some laboratories. So I'd like to give you just a status report on where that method is to give you a little bit of data. And then I'd also like to, to kind of address the issue of phthalates in whole because you'll notice that for those people who work on methods, phthalates are particularly troublesome because the fact is that the method no longer is what it, what it was designed to do. We started off with toys and we started off with six phthalates. 
And in the last two or three years, now we're all of a sudden we're looking at electronic products, we're looking at food containers, we're looking at uh, a whole variety of different matrices. And you'll notice that we've gone from six phthalates to now there's interest in more than six, and in some cases 15 and 16 phthalates. So whereas we started with toys and consumer products, now we have to work, uh, the stakeholders include uh, formulators, plastic, uh, recyclers, manufacturers, retailers, consumers. All of a sudden, everybody's interested in phthalates. And what we find out is interest in phthalates all over the world. And this is all well and good, except for now you notice that the list is starting to expand a little bit. And so some of the electronics companies have included things like uh, diisobutyl phthalate, which is a, which is a, a plasticizer that's not too, uh, not too uncommon. It's a low-cost replacement for DBP. And so now we've gone from, f from three regulated phthalates to a possible six phthalates, seven phthalates, and you can see we, we're having the typical encounter here, and that is as we develop a method, we all of a sudden we include more and more matrices, and as we do that, we want more and more compounds, and as we do that, of course, we want more and more sensitivity. And so uh, those of us that work on methods, this is a continuing problem. There's even, there's even individual countries that are writing general methods that are promulgated. These, uh, most of them are in 2011, and these are just mentioning things like all products containing phthalates. I mean, that's a pretty general description for, for, for method to address. And because now you hear more and more about the countries not being important, but global, global international corporations really being the boundaries, there are many corporations that work on a global scale that have their own in-house methods and in-house lists of compounds and in-house detection limits for a various number of phthalates. And so these are just some of the electronics companies that we, we know and we're familiar with that are working on phthalates and, and recycled plastics and different lists than we work on right now. So we've gone from in the beginning the ASTM method is PVC and six compounds. So now we're talking about maybe 15 or 16 and way beyond PVC. So let me back up a little bit and talk about the ASTM method. We're looking for a standard practice for the determination of low-level phthalates and polyvinyl chloride. And the method that, that seems to give us the best results is thermal absorption GC mass spec. So there's really five steps in this method, and this is the most difficult step, this step right here called sample homogeneity, because when you take a toy, for example, different parts of that toy are made up of different plastics. And each of those different parts of plastics can have a different level of phthalate. And so I would say if I, if I were to look at the overall scope of analyzing for phthalates in, in, in materials, the biggest problem is a homogeneous sample. Because if I take this toy apart, I can get three different numbers. Some of them are good and some of them are a little bit higher. A circuit board poses the same problem, a food container poses the same problem, and so on and so forth. So this is the single most difficult thing to do, and that is to get a, a, a homogeneous sample. Now it sounds nice to say crown milling. You go into laboratories that do crown milling and contamination, crosstalk between crown mills is ever present. And so one of the problems with phthalates, as we, as we mentioned here, is contamination. Well, right off the bat, if you're using one crown mill to do five toys, <laughs> the possibility for cross-contamination is very high. This is the toughest step. The method that the, uh, the, the, thermal, the ASTM method for, based on thermal desorption GCMS spec uses two solutions. One is just a standard solution of the phthalates of interest, and the other is the sample itself, which is dissolved in tetrahydrofuran. So this is the, there's only two solutions involved. The injection is simply placing these solutions in a small container, raising the temperature of the container such that the target compounds evolve or, or bake out or ex thermally extracted, and analyzing just that portion of the sample that contains the phthalates. Separation is done by a standard 30 meter DB5 or 5% phenyl column, and detector, you can pick them. Most of the work we've been done has been done with scanning MS. Several of the validation labs use the SIM MS. You can use quadruple, triple quads. You can use negative ion CI. This is the area where the method seems to be the most applicable, and that is this is, this is unlike the first talk. This is how to get the sample prepared and how to get the sample into the column. Okay. What column you use is up to you. It's independent of the column choice. What sort of detection algorithm or system you want to use is up to you. So, so this is the sample prep. The whole idea here is to get rid of the solvents and get rid of the glassware. 
because I've gone into laboratories who do this, and they'll tell me oftentimes they spend more time cleaning soxlets than using soxlets. Because phthalates are difficult to get rid of. And so what we do here is we start off with the product, some sort of material. Could be a circuit board, could be a duck. We all like ducks. You crowd mill it, you want the smallest pieces you can. If possible, you want dust because you want a homogeneous bottle of dust. You take a small portion of that and put it in a volumetric. This is a 10 milliliter volumetric. So now you've got so much weight. You add to that THF. You make a solution now. So now you have a solution, a THF solution of your sample. <coughs> The method calls for taking 10 microliters of that, put it in a small cup and evaporating the solvent such that you end with a very thin film of the sample on the inside surface of the cup at the bottom. So to prepare a sample like this, once the crowd milling has been done, to prepare a sample like this takes on the order of five minutes. The only solvent you're going to use is 10 milliliters of the THF. You're going to use disposable glassware, so there's no worry about contamination or cross-contamination. That little cup then is ready to be analyzed. Now, if you wanted to do a, a screening method, it's not necessary to go through the thin film process. And that is you can take this sample dust from your jar and just weigh in 100 micrograms or 200 micrograms and put it directly in the cup. So you analyze it as a solid. If you'd like to add an internal standard at that point right now, just to monitor your performance, that's easily done. So either way, you end up with a cup that's ready to analyze. Now, the difference between a thin film, that is making a THF solution, putting it on the cup, and then evaporating the solvent, I'm using the solid material is basically reflected in the precision. So if I use a THF solution, this is a half a milligram of sample now, you can see for, for this DEHB, the percent relative standard deviation is about 1%, uh, four injections. If I use the solid form for a screening method, where I just take the dust, if you will, 5, 0.5 milligrams of dust and put it in the cup and analyze it directly, you can see my precision goes down. And of course, the reason for that is, is if I look at this, this collection of dust that I have, the, the chances of having the same amount of particles in each sample are, are, are remote. So I get a little bit more scattered in the data. Where if I make up a solution, I can analyze that same solution numerous times and get exactly the same precision. But for a screening technique, the, the solid analysis seems to work just fine. Can we hold to the end here? Thank you. So the sample sits in a little cup. This is on top of a liner to make my injection. I drop the cup in the, in, the, in the furnace. The furnace is at 100 degrees. I heat the furnace to 200, 320 degrees. And as I heat it up, the phthalates will evolve, and those are carried onto the column. These little cups then can be placed in an auto sample, and I can do a number of samples. Now, one sample per hour. The reason for that is, is because the calibration, the quantitation is done by standard addition. That requires two analysis, one of the sample and one of the, and the samples that's been spiked with a known amount. So that's two analysis. So about one an hour. If you're going to do a screening sample, that means one, I don't have to program from one to 320, I just drop it into 320. So I don't have that 11 minute, if you will, sample prep or extraction step. And then I could do about three per hour in the screening mode. So the sample is heated. I thermally extract the phthalates of interest. <laughs> They go on to the column and I get my chromatogram. The conditions I'm using for my survey mode are basically 100 to, to 700 at a fairly high rate. That's going to allow me to, to profile or characterize the sample. And it tells me where the phthalates come in, the temperature zone over which the phthalates evolve. And then I do my thermal desorption. My thermal desorption basically is 100 to 320 at 20 degrees a minute. If you're using a thin film, you can do it 40 degrees a minute. It really won't make much difference. This goes on to a column at, at 80 degrees. So here's what it looks like. The top trace is my screen. I don't have to do the screening for every sample. I, uh, the, the importance of the screen is it characterizes the, the sample. If I'm doing PVCs forever, I only have to do this once. If I'm doing polypropylene, I only have to do it once. But if I'm doing circuit boards or if I'm doing uh, different kinds of materials, then maybe I have to do my screen to find out where my, if my phthalates have shifted. But you can see from the top trace, this is, this is a PVC sample, dench is a plasticizer. I get a large group of compounds out. That's the phthalates, any dench may be present. There's also a peak for HCl, because that's a decomposition product of, of polyvinyl chloride. And then, of course, I get my, my fraction out there where I've, where I've polymerized or pyrolyzed the PVC. So I, I define my zone by looking at ions. 
and you can see the lower trace where it says phthalates 149. You can see all the 149, all my phthalates are out by 320. And so my thermal desorption zone is 100 to 320 at 20 degrees a minute. The nice thing about this is by doing this, I'm going to extract those phthalates and then put those on a column for separation, but I leave behind in the cup all the polymer. So I don't have to worry about baking the, pol baking the system up system out to clean up the polymer. I don't have to worry about contamination of my system as I backflash. Or, or I, I, the polymer just stays in the cup, and when I'm done, I wash the polymer out and reuse the cup or get a new cup. All I'm going to inject onto the GC is just that fraction of the sample that's extracted at 320 degrees. So I can identify the different compounds by ions. This right here, again, this is just your just, just standard. This is probably more inter interesting right here. This is the reproducibility. This is six injectors of a PVC dense sample. And it's a little hard to read, but what I have here is the percent relative standard deviation or the precision of a, a multiple runs of the same sample. And you can see the precision across the board is less than, less than 2%. So I can take one solution and analyze it six times, and my precision is pretty darn good. Remember, I mentioned that this is a standard addition method. So I'm going to run my sample and get an area number for my, for my compound. And then I'm going to spike the sample with a known amount, in this case, 0.15% concentration. And I'm going to rerun the sample. So this is just the spike samples. I just show three of these right here. So this is the PVC dense sample that's been spiked with a known amount of each of the phthalates. And again, you can see the precision across the bottom of, of the spike numbers, again, less than 2%. So it's very precise. I end up with a series of curves like this. So these are the six calibration curves for the six compounds. The one in the middle is at the zero. That's the sample number. The one on the far right, that's the spike number. And there's some mathematics that go through, and I can calculate the amount of, 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 amount of, of each of the phthalates in the original sample. And if you do that, again, you can see the precision there is less than 2%. And it's a little hard to read, but the numbers, the concentration of this, of each phthalate in this particular one was about 980, 990 nanograms. So the accuracy is pretty good. Now, the IEC in Korea is also interested in this method. This is some of their work. These are their six calibration curves. Only in this case, they spiked with three, three different levels. And all you do is take that one solution, and you can see from your upper right trace, one case you put two microliters, the next case three microliters, the next case five microliters, the next case eight microliters. That's how you get your multiple points. So it's still one solution. And you can see their recoveries are of, of all the six phthalates are pretty good. And their precision is also less than 1% one, 1 in this case. Now, we did a method validation study. That is, we went out and found five laboratories who were willing to try this. These are laboratories that hadn't done this before. In one case, one of the laboratories had a new hire do the, do the study for us. And this is, this is what we found from the validation study. I sent them four samples, two of them were the same sample. <laughs> uh, thermal absorption temperature is system dependent. By that, I mean if, if you have a Frontier system or a PVT in the system or a CDS system or a Gerstle system, whatever system you're using for your thermal absorption, you have to be very sure that what you're looking at is the sample temperature and not the thermocouple temperature. So there's some differences in some systems between the set point and the actual point. All you really do is run the, the EGA and you can determine the temperature range over which that system operates best. Some of the validation labs use SIM, some of the validation labs use SCAN. Both produce comparable data. Now, thin fill columns are definitely preferred over thick film columns. We don't want a whole lot of retention and a whole lot of time in there. The standard edition, everyone used standard edition. The one point standard edition, the R squared, was always greater than 0.99. If you, if you recall back to this study, this is, this is three points plus the sample, and the R squares on all these are one. But these five laboratories all did 0.99 or better. The inner lab injection to injection reproducibility is less than 5%. The data I've shown here is all about 2%. One of my five labs with the newbie, <laughs> uh, they, were, they were about 30% higher than everybody else in the whole wide world. So there was some systematic issue there, but I included all their data. That's how it comes out to be 5%. The inter-lab sample-to-sample reproducibility is always less than 10%, and the laboratory-to-laboratory -laboratory accuracy is 25%. Now, again, if I take out the data from that one lab, it drops down to about 10%, but 
I, I can't find a reason to do that. So these are the numbers we came up with from the validation study of these five laboratories. Now, all of a sudden we're getting requests for extended target compound list. So here's the extended target compound list we've been asked to look at next is this method. I've highlighted and read the six compounds we started with. And in order to do this chromatographically, it's a simple thing. You just drop the initial temperature from 100 to 80 degrees, and you try to do a little bit better separation on that front end. But it's still, you notice it only goes up to DIDP, so it doesn't go any further, and so the analysis time is still on the order of about 20 minutes. So it hasn't really lengthened your, your analysis time, and since your sample prep time is making up a 10 microliter, a 10 milliliter solution of THF, it's, it doesn't affect any of your sample prep and your operational parameters. So it looks, sounds like it's almost too good to be true. We've done this now for, for three years. The TD method is easy. It takes one syringe and a little bit of glassware. It's clean. There's no cleaning, cleaning and cleaning and cleaning socks and extractors and that sort of thing. It's green because I'm using almost no solvent at all, and it's fully automated. That sounds really, really good. It's precise and accurate. The precision is always less than 2%. The accuracy is plus or minus 10% in, in your laboratory. And it accommodates an extended compound list. So this is all well and good. There is a downside, though. And the downside is <laughs> this run-to-run -run contamination issue is a real problem. Okay. The, uh, at 1,000 parts per million, it's not, not too much of an issue. That's bucket chemistry. But as the, as the detection, uh, as the sensitivity requirements get higher and higher, more and more sensitivity, we have to wait, find a way to really monitor this contamination. When the contamination is in the injection port. There's no doubt about that. Also, the quantines have to be verified as we change matrices. That's one thing to look at PVC, which is what the ASTM method was focused on, and we know polypropylene and polyethylene, and we've done a number of different polymers. But what happens with the circuit board? What happens with some kind of material you haven't really looked at? So you really have to verify that you have no, in, no interference when you start changing matrices. And the, second, the third thing is when you deal with these compounds that are isomeric mi mixtures like DIDP, the quantitation becomes a little bit more difficult than it could be. Although my mother will kill me for saying this, it could be HPLC may be a better way to do these multiple, these compounds that have a lot of different isomers. So in the end, those of us that develop methods are in, a, are in the deep trouble here. Because now we've got, a, we've got a method now that was developed for six compounds in PVC, and we're asked to do more and more phthalates. And we're asked to do it more and more different matrices. And we're being asked to get lower and lower, uh, higher, I guess higher and higher sensitivity. And in the case of phthalates, this can be a real challenge for the laboratory. Any questions? We have time for one or two questions. Yes. Your relative standard deviation, is that one sigma? I mean, how is it, how is it RSD calculated? Yeah, yeah that, that's one and a half sigma. Yes. The precision and accuracy of this method is based on the fact that you use cryogenic milling prep your sample, right? The, the, the yeah, the, the question is, is the precision and accuracy dependent upon the cryogenic building of the sample? Right. Isn't that great? All, all the work here was done with PVC standards that were prepared by one of the members of the ASTM committee. And so it was literally a sheet of PVC. And so... I'm more concerned about the real-life application. Yes. If you take, say, that little duck and you mill that, what if you have... See, now you're getting into legal issues. I mean, obviously you are as a citizen, I think you are, but as the, the methodology that we're familiar with, it calls for a number for the entire product. And so, yes, you are diluting the beak, but on the, on the other hand, you know, how, how much the beak is of the, of the duck, you know what? But that's the critical issue, is that homogeneity, sample homogeneity. Uh, Joel has an addendum to that. Just uh, uh, quickly to uh, uh, add on to that, that we're really not here to talk about the uh, policy and the regulations, but uh, we have uh, uh, issued guidance that it's the uh, component parts uh, that uh, the phthalates limit applies to. So where our very initial uh, guidance was uh, different based on the, the initial read of the uh, 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 rule, um, it, we have uh, guided that it's the uh, uh, individual component parts uh, uh, 
but regardless of that, then the, the analysis is, is still uh, uh, the same. All right, let's thank Bob. Uh, up next, we have uh, Chris Steele from uh, Bureau Veritas. Thanks, Matt. Um, yes, I'm filling in for Lisa Clarice, our global technical consultant um, specialist, because she is, uh, there's a touch of a flu bug uh, going, uh, spreading around at her Buffalo office. So hopefully I don't uh, get it after, after we leave uh, town to get back to Buffalo. But uh, um, so I'm speaking on behalf of Bureau Veritas in lieu of her. So um, yes, no problem. Um, so um, thank you, Matt, for uh, letting uh, me represent our company here. And uh, I'm here today to talk about um, using a dual instrumentation for phthalates analysis and plastics. And what I mean by that is uh, two systems, two mass spectrometers. Uh, the first, of course, GCMS, as I think a lot of you are familiar with and that the CPSC method revolves around. Uh, but secondly, uh, the LCMS system, um, using both in conjunction uh, with each other, um, just to kind of rule out any uh, interferences that GCMS may pose, basically to get like a second set of eyes um, looking at a particular uh, sample scan. Uh, Bureau Veritas has had about, I'm guessing, at least 10 years of experience um, testing for phthalates in a variety of consumer products, many different plastics, um, and I'm here to try to share with you hopefully some inf helpful, helpful information that uh, has worked for us in our testing approach um, to resolve these tricky samples. Um, as we know, as time goes on uh, and regulations are expanding, manufacturers seem to be uh, trying to get more and more clever as trying to find workarounds to find alternatives, uh, plasticizer alternatives to uh, have their um, samples compliant. So uh, in effect, you're going to we see it. We see a lot of different uh, scans in our phthalate extracts because of this, because they're using uh, uh, Chris, alternatives. Sorry. They can't hear you in the back. Can you speak a little bit louder? Sure, sure. Sorry. Um, so that's, that's my purpose here today, is to um, try to share with you our phthalate testing approach. Um, so just as a quick outline, uh, I'm going to go over the test method that we use. Uh, the instrumentation that we use, uh, GCMS and LCS, LCMS. Uh, of course, results in interpretation, and I'll answer, try to answer any questions you may have uh, about our approach. Um, our test method, uh, extremely similar to um, what's in the CPSC. Uh, essentially, we cut the sample into very small pieces uh, of the component. We place it into a disposable glass reaction vessel or vial. Um, then we add tetrahydrofuran, uh, THF, and sonicate it at uh, 40 degrees centigrade for 30 minutes, um, which in most cases will be long enough and aggressive enough to get that into the organic solution. Um, and sonicate an additional 30 minutes if that sample does not visibly dissolve. Uh, sometimes that happens with harder plastics. Um, after which, uh, acetonitrile uh, is what we use. Uh, acetonitrile, ACN, is added dropwise to precipitate out the polymer. Um, that's been very useful for us. Um, uh, I know uh, other solvents, um, I think CPSC mentions hexane, using hexane. Uh, other labs may be using methanol. They may work um, in particular applications or plastics. Uh, PVC probably works, but um, we've found that acetonitrile will precipitate out more polymer, uh, more types of polymers than the other solvents. So in, in the end, it results in a, a cleaner uh, layer on top of your uh, precipitated plasticide, or uh, sorry, precipitated uh, polymer. Um, so you're all that junk and interfering, things that may interfere with the analysis will come out of that solution and then you can inject a much more uh, clean uh, solution into your instrument. Um, so once that's done, uh, you allow it to stand for 30 minutes um, and uh, take that solution 
into, put it into an auto sampler vial, and it's ready for analysis. Um, actually, you add anthracene, deuterated anthracene um, as an internal standard, then you can filter it and analyze it by GCMS uh, and or LCMS. And uh, currently, uh, uh, LCMS is not uh, listed in the CPS method uh, currently. I will go, most of you probably are already aware of the function of uh, gas chromatography. You have a carrier gas, usually helium. Um, the sample is injected in the injector, volatilized, goes to the column. Um, the analytes separate out from one another, as well as any interfering compounds, they separate out from one another. Then it enters the mass spec detector, fragmentation occurs, a mass spectrum is produced, and, and the signal is plotted on the chromatogram. <clears throat> okay, what we're looking at here is just an example of uh, many different types of phthalates that are out there. Obviously, it's not a complete list, um, but it's just, uh, it's just here to demonstrate um, what we could potentially be looking at when we analyze a particular sample extract. Uh, any one of these or uh, combination of these could be found um, in your sample. So a lot of them are nice, clean needle peaks. Um, of course, as Matt has mentioned, and many of you already know, we have the broad finger peak type phthalates, um, two that are regulated, DINP, DIDP. Um, you can't see it too much on this slide, but you know it's, it's buried in there uh, between the 12 and 13 minute range. Um, so this is just to demonstrate uh, what we could be looking at in a sample. And like I said, this is not a complete list uh, by any means. Um, some of these are regulated, some are not. Um, so go on to our next slide. Uh, this is just an example of a mass spectrum um, of DBP, just as an example. If we go back a slide, DBP is uh, just one that's highlighted as an example. If we look at the mass spectrum, Creating that response, this is it. Um, of course, uh, base peak 149 is, is very common. Um, qualifying ion could be 223, and, which is unique to DBP. Um, uh, GC mass spectrum of DINP and DIDP, those troublesome finger peaks. Um, you could, uh, DINP would be 293. You could extract that out of the chromatogram, but even doing so, it still can sometimes be a challenge, uh, depending on what, a, what you might have interfering with that. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in the upcoming slides as well. Um, this is a, an example of a um, non-regulated phthalate, currently non-regulated. You never know what the future holds. Diisooctal phthalate. Um, basically, this is a finger peak as well. This may be present in a sample. You don't know what manufacturers are putting in. Um, we've certainly seen it uh, many times before in samples. Uh, Diisooctal phthalate, uh, it's, a, it's like a couple carbon, carbon chains less, of course, than di DINP and DIDP, the nonals and decals. Um, so here you can see the retention time. It's a range. It's a broad range. It's, it's an isomeric mix, of course, and that's why it looks the way it does. Um, so you can see it spans across the timeline, the retention timeline, uh, you know, between like 11.25 minutes to 12 and a half. Um, so it's, if you see something like this in a sample, it, it can be challenging to uh, properly integrate uh, the regulated phthalates or even see if they're there, DINP, DIDP, uh, even after ion extraction, uh, honing in on a particular uh, ion that may be unique to that particular uh, phthalate. <clears throat> um, so here is uh, an example of DINP on a GC chromatogram uh, highlighted there. It's, 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 if you want to call that an apex, it's peaking out around 13 minutes, but the range of isomers begins at about 12 and a half and extends out to like 13 and a half minutes. So um, anyone doing Phthalate analysis by GC, uh, this is second nature, I'm sure, see this all the time. Um, so again, it's very uh, difficult to integrate uh, 
and try to accurately capture the, the area counts of that uh, DINP peak uh, if you have other interferences uh, or other phthalates present. It, it just it can be challenging on the GC. So uh, here we're just looking at some chemical structures of um, some regulated phthalates. Uh, we have DNOP, DINP, DIDP. Uh, DNOP is unbranched, so that's a, that's a, a single peak. Uh, but all three of these have roughly the same retention time on GC. Um, DNOP is an octal. Uh, DIOP, which I mentioned before, is an isooctal. So you're going to see uh, 279, IN 279, even if you extract it out for DNOP. If you have DIOP in your sample, I mean, what do you do? You see this big unre unregulated uh, 279 ion chromatogram, and then you may or may not see this little sharp peak come out of DN uh, that may or may not be DNOP. If it is DNOP, and you're confident it is, okay, now how do you quanti quantitate it? It's very hard to baseline integrate when it's coming out of uh, a, a mess. Um, so uh, DINP and DIDP, of course, are isomeric uh, finger peaks. Um, they actually overlap on GC, even though they have um, uh, quantifying or qualifying ions associated with them. Um, they can be troublesome as well. Uh, and of course, the reason that they are broad finger peaks is because uh, isononal, DINP, and isodacal, DIDP, um, have, uh, it could be a multitude of arrangements of the uh, groups on them, like methyl groups, that could be located in, in many different uh, statistical possibility. And that's why you see that broad finger peak, of course. It's not just a single analyte. It's a mixture of isomers. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar uh, with why they look the way they do on GC. Um, now let's get into LCMS instrumentation, liquid chromatography, uh, coupled with a mass spectrometer. Uh, pretty much uh, basically the same principles, GCMS, uh, you're just using liquid as the mobile phase or carrier to carry along um, your analytes. Um, they get separated by a column, the same manner, enters um, spray chamber, mobile phase is evaporated, fragmentation occurs, um, and then the resulting ions are separated out by mass to charge ratio. And a response is uh, created as well as a spectrum. So this is an example. This is a DINP at 1 ppm on the LCMS. So uh, what we're looking at here is um, we run in scan mode. This is actually IN 419, I believe, um, of DINP. And this is only 1 ppm. We do run standards a little bit lower than this. But the point is you can see um, how much better it looks to a chemist. I mean, this, this, I like the way it looks. It's very integratable. The signal to noise ratio is very large. Um, it's just just a great responding um, signal uh, for DINP. It just jumps out of the baseline. It's 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 great. Uh, DIDP uh, at 1 ppm um, similar similar look to it. Um, comes right out of the baseline. Um, you know you get a much better response, of course, than uh, compared to GC. Uh, there's no broad finger peaks, um, and actually DIDP is fully resolved from DINP um, on the LCMS. Are, are you using reverse phase? I'm sorry? Is this reverse phase HPLC? Or? Uh, yeah, it's reverse phase, yep. And, and this slide is just kind of giving you a side-by-side, -side, um, a DINP. In the upper right on the LCMS, DINP, on the lower left on the GCMS, um, you can see it, it's hard to see, of course, because DINP and GCMS relative to the uh, single uh, analytes, um, it just kind of is not very responsive because it's just an isomeric mix. So um, that's one advantage that we found with uh, using LCMS is really for, for those finger peaks. Um, so uh, 
our approach, like I said, we use both GCMS and LCMS in conjunction with one another. Um, if, if the lab decides to use GCMS primarily, uh, it's kind of a flow chart showing what should be done. Uh, if you find the phthalates DNOP, DIDP, DINP, um, they should be confirmed on LCMS um, just, just to ensure a good quantitation um, and just to confirm that they're there. Um, and now if you're going to uh, primarily use LCMS, um, you can do that as well. Uh, but then you got, there's things you need to know about that, though. Uh, if you find DBP, di dibutyl phthalate, which is regulated, um, it also, it, well, it will co-elute with an unregulated phthalate, diisobutyl phthalate. So if you're getting a detection on DBP, it may really be diisobutyl phthalate. Um, they, they essentially co-elute with one another. Um, so that's why if you do find DBP, uh, it's, it's pretty recommended, pretty urgent that you confirm it by GCMS to see is it the regulated form or the unregulated or a mixture of both. And we've seen all three uh, cases there. Um, so that, that's pretty much the flow that, uh, that we found to work for us. Um, uh, so in conclusion, uh, a dual instrument system uh, works for us. Uh, it's been a useful approach, enhancing our data integrity um, with challenging samples. And like I said before, as time goes on, uh, we just, just when you think you've seen it all, you, you haven't. We've seen new plastics, plastics come out with different compounds and adding new challenges. Um, it's like an ongoing uh, process. The learning never ends. Um, so this is what Bureau, Ver Bureau, Ver Bureau Veritas has found to work for us in our long history of phthalate testing um, in order to provide clear results from an otherwise messy scan. Um, just because of this, we feel uh, much more confident um, in the data that we issue. Basically, we are having two detectors give us data if need be. Um, it's also important to note that you don't need a state of the art GCMS or LCMS. I mean, you can use models that have been around for years. It's not like you have to go out and buy the, the most sensitive instrument uh, to take this approach on. So that in that sense, it helps labs that are looking for, uh, you know, cost savings, of course. So um, in the end, it's all about just uh, feeling confident about uh, the results and data that your lab is issuing with these tricky samples. Um, are there any questions? We have time for a couple questions. Yes. Do, do your labs in Asia all use the, um, the dual um, method, or is it just in Buffalo? For, yes. Uh, the question was, do our labs in Asia use the dual uh, method approach? Um, I'm not sure. I, I, from my understanding, I know they, they have both. Okay. My uh, consultant there is saying, yes, they do. <laughs> I knew they had both instrumentations, uh, but I just got confirmation that, yes, they do. The question was, is this uh, our standard practice um, in, in testing for DIMP and DIDP? Yes, it is. Um, yeah, just because it, it's just so tricky on GCMS, we wouldn't just, we just wouldn't feel that confident in issuing results if, if we get something that would really challenge the chromatography like we often see on GCMS. So yeah, this, this is our, um, our, our good practice here at BB. Yep, go ahead. Yep. On LCMS? Yes. Sure. Actually, I can go back. You, I'm sorry if you had that slide. I apologize. That's fine. Um, actually, if we overlaid them, it'd show better. But this is, uh, there are two separate ion extractions as well. This is, uh, I believe, four, I think it's 419 on the LCMS. Um, you want to take a look at this. You know, starting off at, you know, 10 and a half going to 12. And here we got 12 to like 14 for the DIDP. So how long is your total runtime for the LCMS? LCMS total runtime, uh, including the post run, I believe is 22 minutes, something like that. 24 minutes. Yeah. Um, just one follow-up question. Uh, have you thought about an ultra-high um, pressure 
Yeah, we're, we're involved in internal correlations with our own company as well as external correlations to see if the methodologies that other labs are using um, are comparable with ours. So, yeah, that's, that's part of our quality control. All right, let's thank Chris. Okay, thank you. Uh, up next, we have Luke Ackerman from the FDA. Thank you all for coming, and uh, thanks for yeah, organizing this. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So um, today I'm going to be discussing DART MS, or direct analysis in real time, which is an ambient ionization uh, mass spectrometry technique as a possible screening method for phthalates. Um, specifically, we've been doing a lot of work on food contact polymers and looking for rapid screening techniques. Uh, phthalates just happens to be one of the model um, additives that we look at whenever we evaluate methodology. So I um, thought perhaps I could share a little bit of our work uh, with you here. And I think just to kind of give you the conclusion, I think DART can be used as a very effective screening technique. Um, it has limited capabilities otherwise, but I'll be going over the details of that. And I work at the Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition at the FDA. Um, we're a research arm of the FDA, so I'm not conducting any regulatory enforcement actions at our facility. We're developing methodology and trying to advance the science at the agency. So I won't be discussing any uh, legal matters either. <laughs> so how does DART work? Uh, well, DART is, as I said, an ambient ionization technique. It's just one commercial uh, application of many different, you've probably heard of DESI, DART, ASAP, uh, gosh, what else? Nano desi, supersonic electro spray ionization. These are all the academic terms for uh, various techniques of producing gas phase ions off of condensed materials. So solids and liquids uh, and turning them into gas phase ions such that mass spectrometry can be used to help analyze the uh, stuff in question. In this particular case, DART is unique and was probably granted a patent because it quenches a plasma. It generates a plasma of helium uh, in the glow discharge area of the diagram here, and then it quenches them on the grounded electrodes uh, in further downstream. It then subsequently heat it, heats that gas, and the quenched plasma generates excited helium or metastable helium, which is just an electron shifted up in energy level uh, in the orbitals of helium. Um, once you heat this helium stream, you now have hot, excited helium. It exits the DART source and into the atmosphere of the lab where you place your sample. Um, the atmosphere in the lab, not surprisingly, contains water vapor. And water um, has a good uh, match with the energy of the excited helium, and it um, produces protonated water clusters. And these protonated water clusters, in turn, ionize any gas phase molecules in the vicinity of the source. Uh, there's been lots of studies on how big of a gap you need, um, and for different compounds, uh, different distances between the exit of the dart and the entrance of the mass spectrometer will yield uh, better results. But in general, you're protonating whatever gas phase ions you can get, and the thermal um, heating of the helium gas also allows thermal transfer to the surfaces. So you're doing thermal desorption. So dart is thermal desorption atmospheric chemical ionization similar to the negative and positive chemical ionization uh, possibilities with standard GCMS techniques, but this is done in the uh, open lab atmosphere. And the advantage of that is that it allows you to stick odd-shaped objects in front of a mass spectrometer. So you don't have to do sample preparation in order to get some sort of representative spectra of the surfaces of the uh, samples that you're looking at. Um, as you can imagine, that creates a whole host of other questions as what kinds of surfaces, how close, what compounds, how hot. Those are all parameters that have to be dictated according to each application. But this is the basic approach uh, that DART takes to producing gas phase ions for mass spectrometry. Um, and what does DART actually look like in practice? We've generated a little movie here. 
Um, one of the advantages of DART is how fast it is. And this will show you um, uh, a mass spectrum of a little uh, sample that was introduced. You probably maybe saw it in the upper right hand corner, a little ga glass capillary came down and uh, was stuck into the DART stream. And you see a peak there at M over Z127. This was our demonstration of how melamine is detected in uh, milk products. So we coated a, a little glass capillary with a milk product, and if there was melamine present, it was ionized in M over Z127, the mass of melamine plus H or plus proton uh, jumps up on the screen there. And you can see the time frame there is on the order of 30 seconds or less per sample. So um, you get an immediate spike in signal uh, and it drops off rather quickly. Um, as fast as your robot can go and pick up another sample or you can go grab another sample, it returns to baseline and you're ready for the next analysis. So what does DART MS measure? Well, it measures mass spectrum because it's, DART is just an ionization te uh, technique for a mass spectrometer. In this case, we interface DART with a Waters Ultima, uh, which is just a simple triple quad, uh, and we looked at the mass spectrum. Uh, because of the way that we set up the, the DART and because of the mass spec, you can see a couple of diagnostic ions here for, in this case, diethyl hexyl phthalate. You see the molecular ion, uh, the M plus H, uh, some of the characteristic fragment ions. We were running this under some slightly fragmenting conditions. Um, and if you use different mass spectrometers, you get different results. So the bottom trace here is the mass spectrum of the same standard um, using a Joel Akutov, which is just a low-end uh, time-of-flight mass spectrometer, about 170K um, for uh, one of those. And as you can see there, even in the presence of a mixed standard, this happened to have a little uh, DINP, a little DIDP, and some DEHP. You can see the dominant ion um, because of uh, the chime on the trace that I picked uh, was the, uh, well, the octal phthalate, I should say, um, signal. And the nice thing about using a TOF is, of course, the added mass accuracy. Um, as you can see, uh, you get uh, high mass accuracy and to a certain degree a good mass resolution. There's certainly other mass spectrometers that can achieve better, but the point being that when you're doing direct analysis or atmospheric um, ionization analysis, you're going to get mixtures and you no longer are using chromatography to help separate your chemicals previous to analysis. So anything that you can do to help you differentiate one molecule from another can help and accurate and high res mass spec can help with that. So what does the DART MS response look like? Well, you're not using chromatography, so you don't have a chromatogram. Now you just have a time trace. Um, this is a, a typical total ion current. It's not a total ion chromatogram. There's no chromatography. Um, of a couple of sample introductions um, in front of a DART. And in this case, uh, this is from a triple quad, the waters that I was mentioning. And you see the tick rise and fall, but rather noisily and rather irreproducibly. But when you go to look at a particular compound of interest, you see um, that the trace is a lot more easy to understand. Um, and in this case, the, the DEHP standard at various concentrations uh, gave a very predictable response as a function of time. So again, we're looking at a mass spectrum as a function of time. So what are all the different dark configurations that I'm, I've been discussing. Well, we started off in our laboratory with a first generation DART, which is kind of a clunky looking thing. Um, and in this particular case, we are using a robotic auto sampler to place uh, little strips of particular polymers in, into the DART stream. You'll see a little glass capillary tube sticking out. That helps transfer the gas stream um, from the ionization region into the mass spectrometer. And because the manufacturer of the DART um, ion source had not uh, interfaced this particular mass spectrometer. We literally just terminated the glass tube immediately adjacent to the mass spectrometer inlet. It wasn't even on axis. Um, and so in that case, our sensitivity was quite poor, and the results that we generate with this configuration weren't really translatable to a lot of the people who had purchased the Joel Acutofs, which was the parent company of the ion source manufacturer. Um, DART is manufactured by uh, ion sets out of Peabody mass. Um, we subsequently purchased two other configurations, a DART Orbi trap and a DART um, uh, Accutoff. So this is the Joel Accutoff and the newest version of their DART source that goes with the Accutoff. Again, as you can see here, the, uh, the silver 
um, cone coming out of the mass spectrometer, that's the inlet. The silver and white cones coming off the dart source, the, that's where the uh, gas exits. We happen to be running a little homemade rail, linear rail, um, through the dart source at this particular case. We were mapping some chemical concentrations across the surface of a piece of packaging. Um, and we just thought we'd try uh, a little linear rail in that particular case. But as you can see, the dart source can be moved back and forth various distances from the mass spectrometer inlet. They even have configurations that allow you to raise and lower it, angle it at different angles. Um, and so you really can adjust the dart source to fit whatever geometries you need for your particular sam uh, samples. The beautiful thing about dart is you can stick really crazy shaped objects in front of it and you can still get reproducible mass spectrum. You don't have to mill, you don't have to homogenize. Now you lose all that information, you lose reproducibility and quantitation and the like, um, because you're not looking at the same sample as you would um, with uh, in, in a typical uh, regulatory analysis. But if you're going to screen uh, stuff, and if you want to have an idea of what, where on a particular object uh, phthalates or any other compound might be, um, for the surfaces of those uh, objects, then DART will allow you to, to do that by looking at only one part of the object at a time. Or if you really want to cover every surface, you could systematically run the whole surface through there. But in either case, um, DART is a quick way for a laboratory worker to look at a sample without having to do prep and without cross-contamination, because there's nothing to contaminate here. The entrance to the mass spectrometer which is going to be less contaminated than if you inject a, a, a plug of solvent from a, from a GC system. So it's, uh, it's got some advantages that way. Here's another angle, us introducing a little piece of, of packaging. Um, you can do it manually. You can use linear rails. They've got transmission configurations where you can deposit uh, uh, extracts onto little gridded wire meshes in the and the helium flows through the wire mesh and dissolves whatever was on the solution that deposited on the grid. Um, you know, there's lots of configurations for introducing samples via DART. So can it quantitate? That's the big question. And the answer is no. Um, so these are some just some straight up solvent um, calibration solutions and just measuring the peak height of the mass spec signal for diethyl hexyl phthalate. Very simple task. N not at all linear, not very reproducible at that. Um, and the reason is, is that various amounts of materials are deposited onto the tip of the glass capillary that we use to sample the liquids. In GC, you're using a syringe to deliver exactly one microliter every single time. Whereas in DART, the current auto sampler configuration dips a melting point capillary into your liquid solution. And depending on how clean that capillary is, how far it's dipped in, how quickly, uh, you know, what, was there a drop shaken off the capillary in the robot's movements over to the dart, you get various quantities deposited on the surface, and then how fast you scan it through there, were there any air disturbances in the lab that shifted gas flow patterns, it desorbs a different amount of material off of that, and a different amount makes it into the mass spec and a different ion signal. But one way to account for all those differences is internal standards. You know, in GCMS, we often do that. You get very nice linear calibration curves when you internal standard normalize your responses. It, can also, it also helps you with troubleshooting uh, issues in your methodology, recovery correction. Um, you don't have to take, you don't have to do quantitative transfers. Um, uh, all of those things are helped by internal standards, and so is dark calibration. When you include just two internal standards, in this case, for these suite of uh, phthalates that you see on the bottom right, I included a labeled standard of diethyl phthalate and a label of diethyl hexyl phthalate and then normalized uh, to one of those two. The uh, relative response is quite linear. Um, and you know R squareds that we go on about, all better than 0.995. But when you look at them on a log scale, you see GCMS is still much more linear than DART. And that makes sense. You're just a lot more controlled sample introduction, a lot more uh, controlled ion transfer uh, into the inlet. Um, not to say that it can't be useful. You can't get good semi-quant data, especially out of liquid solutions, but it's never going to be the same as GCMS. And I would like to point out this is over five orders of magnitude, so clearly a very broad range here. Um, 
and, and but still GCMS is the gold standard for quantitation. So it can quantitate in solutions, but we're not looking at solutions, we're looking at surfaces. So how sensitive is DART when it comes to looking at surfaces? Well, we had another project where we were, we were looking at um, uh, photo initiators um, transferring from the print side of a printed piece of food packaging to the food contact side of an adjacent piece of food packaging. Uh, it's called set off. And we decided to look at Ergocure 184, a common photo initiator, by producing standard samples with various levels of the photo initiator on the surface of the polymer. This, I believe, was an LDPE uh, film. And what we saw was just some of the concentrations of the samples that we prepared. You can see that the surficial concentrations at DART, at which DART is able to differentiate from the blanks, is right around 0.25 nanograms per square centimeter. So definitely down in the uh, low fractions of a uh, hundredth of a percent level. Um, you, you're going to see surficial concentrations orders of magnitude higher if you're looking at even 0.1 percent phthalate in a, in a polymer. So clearly it's way more than sensitive enough for these types of compounds. We haven't done this exact procedure with phthalates, but the responsiveness of, of, DART, and of DART to ergocure and phthalates is very comparable. They're both small molecules. I think this vapor pressure of this compound is almost exactly the same as diethyl hexyl phthalate. Um, vapor pressure is a pretty big factor when you're thermally desorbing something off of a surface. So we see pretty comparable responses. In that case, I expense, expect the sensitivity um, for phthalates to be very comparable. And then we also need the technique to identify the phthalates. And in particular, the nice thing about DART, as I showed you back at the beginning, is it produces almost exclusively molecular ion, that is M plus H. You know, one of the reasons why we like to use chemical ionization, it's a much softer ionization technique. It doesn't give you as reproducible mass spectrum on those fragment ions, but uh, it, it gives you a lot of a very specific molecular ion to work with. You can also uh, include a little ammonia hydroxide in, in the lab environment or swab it onto the surface of a polymer and you can produce ammonia uh, instead of protonated uh, molecule uh, ions. So instead of M plus H, it's M plus NH4. Uh, it's often a common technique to look at both of those ions as a way of confirming that um, you know the 195 ion you see is really um, uh, corresponding to, to dimethyl phthalate or whatnot. And as, is, as we all know, uh, this M plus H ion is very useful. The fragment ions help a little bit more, but isomers produce all the same ions in theory. And they should because they're isomers. They're positional isomers. Um, so diethyl hexyl phthalate and, and octyl phthalate are a perfect example. Um, and other work by other folks, including Rothenbacher and, and Schwach, um, it, published in Rapid Communication and Mass Spec, took a close look at this. I think Kuki out of Hungary also did the same thing in International Mass Spec uh, Journal. And what they found is the 261 to 279, the, um, the, eth the minus ethylene and minus ethenol uh, fragments um, are produced in differential ratios. And that really froze up. And you can differentiate ethyl hexyl and N octyl that way. The trouble is, is a lot of things can produce 261 and 279. And pretty much any isomeric um, octyl phthalate can do that to varying degrees. And what if you have mixtures of these phthalates? So when we looked at a particular uh, PP and LDPE film um, for various phthalates, we see the molecular ions of ethyl hexyl or N octyl and, and also diisononal phthalate. Um, when we look at the ion ratios of the fragments, 279 clearly uh, exceeds 261, suggesting it's ethyl hexyl phthalate. Um, you know, the ratio is 1.7, but in the standards, that ratio was 3.3. So what does this mean? And in our initial analysis of this sample, which is the cookie bar at the bottom of the chart there, we said that we thought there's low hundreds of nanograms per square centimeter of diethyl hexyl phthalate. And we didn't think there was an octal phthalate. Um, we then subjected these same samples to extraction LCMS analysis. Here's the chromatogram. And we focused a lot on the isononal phthalate in that particular case. And what we saw was um, a very odd shaped LCMS peak. We expect nice sharp LCMS peaks for the isononal. And we suspected it was an N octodecyl phthalate, 
which would be a particular um, structural isomer of, of the nonal phthalates. And sure enough, when we spike it with an additional 100 ppb of DINIP, that small shoulder goes up. So DINIP is the shoulder, and n octadecyl phthalate was the dominant compound in this particular package. Similar analysis of ethyl hexyl and n octal in this particular uh, an compound, the cookie bar, showed, as you can see on the bottom, that there was actually nearly equivalent concentrations of n octal phthalate and ethyl hexyl phthalate. That's why our ion ratios of those fragments switched by DART MS, and we completely missed the n octadecyl phthalate uh, in this particular sample. So what can we can conclude from all of this? Well, sample positioning affects DART response. It's more than sensitive enough for uh, phthalate analysis. It can be quantitative in certain s situations when you use internal standards and especially with solvents. It can be semi-quantitative off of polymer surfaces, especially if you can deposit an internal standard, which I know some NIST groups have been working on for the explosives uh, methods. They've been working on printing standards on surfaces. Um, and it cannot reliably identify different isomers of different phthalates, not in mixtures. Um, and one last note is the time response of DART. So this is a typical tick, and this is what that stand, uh, this is a total ion current of a typical standard uh, for DART. And what you see here is first the solvent, ethyl hexyl phthalate, or ethyl acetate, excuse me, um, came off the surface of the, of the tip, and then the diethyl hexyl phthalate in the last second. And the time scales of these are about one sixth to one ninth of a second. So you need to be measuring your, your mass spectral traces at six to nine hertz at least, so cycles per second, in order for DART to really be useful uh, in capturing the actual quant signal. So these are all things that we need to keep in mind, but again, the main points, it cannot reliably identify the different isomers. It can quant under certain circumstances, but it can certainly screen for the presence of various phthalates. Thank you. Do you have any questions? I would probably have time for one question. <laughs> when you're doing solids, can you uh, comment on the spatial resolution of this technique? Well, if you can reliably move uh, the sample through the dark stream, um, like we were doing with that little linear rail on and the surface, uh, then you can assign a spatial map. That'll be our next publication, um, where we reproduce the set-off image of a print on the adjacent piece of packaging, you can see the same trademark logos and, you know, images, but just recreated in a chemical map. So if you had, like, stripes, a pattern of stripes, what would, you know, the smallest stripe would be? Well, so the width of the, of the dart beam is on the order of about a centimeter, um, or three quarters of a centimeter, somewhere around there. Um, I know that they're working on different iterations that have narrower uh, helium beam widths, um, but really double or triple that, and that's probably the double that, and that's probably the smallest scale of resolution you're going to achieve. And then, of course, you can screw it up by moving the sample too fast or irreproducibly, stuff like that. Well, I can move on. Sorry. sorry. <laughs> but thank Luke. Uh, yeah, why don't we go ahead, we'll break for lunch now, and uh, we'll start back up again at uh, 1 o'clock.